Okay, cool. So the 10 things you should do before Milky Way. These are things with your camera, and these are also things with your gear. Um, I need to get Reflector up. I'm going to get Reflector up so I can share this phone because I'm going to be going into it. So once Reflector is working, I should have... Oh, it's actually mirroring immediately. It's not really, is it? Let's find out. Is my phone on here? I don't see it in any of the pictures. Yeah, I don't think it is. I think I have to redo it. So that'll be fine. I'll do that in the background while I give you guys the first tip. So know the moon and Milky Way. The moon and Milky Way. To get to know the moon window of opportunity, you'll need another PDF. But just let me go over it fast. This is the moon woo. The moon woo is every night you're dealing with a twilight period and daylight period. And then after twilight, you get a full darkness. So you start off the day, then you have a sunset, then you have the first twilight period, a second and a third twilight period, and then this period of full darkness that goes all the way through the night and into the morning where the twilight begins again with the lesser twilight of astronomical twilight, a little bit brighter nautical twilight, the extra bright civil twilight, and then sunrise begins in daylight. So you've got this window of opportunity for Milky Way in between these two twilight periods, and I just simply put, it's called full darkness. Well, the thing that you need to know is that the moon sometimes gets in the way of that full darkness. And what you're going to end up having is that the first quarter moon, it's halfway full. Well, it's also got a halfway of the night that it's taken over. And so when you look at it from the northern hemisphere, you can basically reverse what you see. You can look up at the moon during the day and go, oh, look at that moon. It's definitely a first quarter, as I can see that the left side is empty and the right side has white. So that is a first quarter moon. And when I look at that and go, okay, from reading left to right, first part is dark, second part is light. So flip it in the northern hemisphere. That means the first part of the night is going to be bright and lit by the moon. And the last part of the night is going to have darkness, as you see represented here. The twilight periods, and then the night begins with the moon up, and then somewhere in the middle of your night, not exactly at the dead center of the night, but somewhere in the middle, it goes down. It finally sets, and now the rest of the night is good. So you have to know these things about the moon, and you can get this and check out the YouTube video where I teach it. Just look up moon window of opportunity. You'll find it, and this PDF you can download as well. In fact, just to, since I tortured you with the audio, I'm going to share it here so you don't even have to sign up for my email in order to get it. So here we go. Another PDF for you right there in the chat saw it down below. So this is going to give you this cheat sheet, this tip sheet that helps you know, okay, what's going on in the northern hemisphere. It's same truth for the southern hemisphere. It's just these graphics will be flipped if you're in the southern hemisphere. All right. So this moon wind of opportunity is key to know so that you're ready to go for a Milky Way at the right time. And so what happens is at the beginning of the season, you need to know what happens with the moon and the Milky Way. You got to work them together. So the Milky Way in the beginning of the season, it takes longer to rise above of the horizon. In the beginning of the season, you won't see it until after midnight, most likely really close to sunrise. Like right now in January, when we first see the Milky Way core again, is going to be just minutes before sunrise. So if that's the case, when do you want the moon window of opportunity to be? You don't want it to be on any of the nights after the full moon, because it's later in the night that the moon exists. And in fact, even a tiny waning crescent, look at this, tiny waning crescent moon is going to get in the way of your January Milky Way. So you can't go out and know this the way that you would want. And so as I'm looking at my phone, who is still for some reason stuck on reflector, which makes me worried because I don't know why that's the case. I want to mirror to this. Will you just mirror? It's not even going to try. I might have to reboot my phone. I think that's what I'll do because I can do that because the phone is not related to what I'm working on right now. So I'm just going to boot my phone down so that I can repower it up and then connect it over here to Reflector and show my phone on the screen so I can give you guys some tips using Pho Planet for Photographers. Photopills has the moon, wind, the moon pill, which is great, but this Planet for Photographers calendar is fantastic and brilliant. So what I'm going to do is go into the second tip before we go back into my phone and talk about this first tip. I just want to emphasize that the season is the beginning of the season. The Milky Way is going to rise later in the morning and towards the morning. And then as it goes through the season, it rises earlier and earlier. So think about January as before sunrise and February a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, and then around midnight in May, 
and then it's going to be already up in the summer. It's already up, visible, and visible all night long. And then by the time you hit into September, it starts to set on you, depending on where you are on latitude. So when it starts setting on you, you have a part of the night again. And so you're looking at that moon window opportunity. The moon window that you want in the later season is no moon at the beginning. So if you're looking at this cheat sheet, you're going to see that actually here's the full moon. Two days later, you've already got this window. Just two days later, it's a waning gibbous, means it's a gigantic moon, and it's just barely been full moon, but there's going to be an hour or more gap right here where there's no moon yet. It hasn't risen. And so even though it's just barely been full moon, you still can go out because that's going to take a sec, and if your Milky Way is already up, then you're set to go at the beginning of the night. So that's the information you need to have. Must know the moon and the Milky Way and know how they work together to have that work well for you. And my phone just needs me to type in my password which is 1234 of course and let's get myself on the right s uh, Wi-Fi okay cool 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 and now <laughs> screen mirroring is now showing an option yay Woo okay so it's gonna pop up a window here in a second I can't move anything because for some time sometimes this will just disappear behind things 7500 that's my code 7500 and I'm gonna show you the calendar that's gonna do all that work for you it's gonna do all that work I just mentioned right there for you built in to the planet for photographers app all right so now I'm gonna go into my phone and we're gonna share that screen and oh yeah but where are you Ha, huh, there you are okay cool so let me see if I actually have a good phone app app list all perfect and then I'm gonna bring this down and over and fit it into that window to make things more you know less distracting for everybody so I'm gonna move that in here to the right spot and then we're gonna talk about this pill or not the pill but this feature in planet for photographers so when you go over here planet pro that's the app let me just show you what that is so as you look at this app icon that's planet for photographers and you don't need the pro version for this you just need planet and this right here is a hamburger menu at the top left. Tap on that guy. And then you're going to scroll down to the calendar. You can see it, my cursor hanging over it right now. <laughs> Dave likes my Calvin Hobbes background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so then calendar, you hit that. And now you have many, many options. And this is where I do some more awkward things where I bring in a zoom display. Ooh, just right. <laughs> I love it. I love it when it remembers the last time I did this. I, I didn't do anything much different. So I'm just going to make this calendar bigger. Uh, you know what? I'm going to show this part extra big first. Just want you guys to notice these calendars right at the bottom. So I'm going to cover up over these and just show you this large part down here at the bottom. So there's important dates, the first one. You tap the next one. It's the moon phase calendar. Oh, I've got a little bit of a ring Yep, that's the circle. The circle is nice because I can move it around and say, I'm looking at this part, this part, and this part, and this part. But I'm going to turn that off for right now. And so I'm looking at the moon phase. Then I click over here on the moonless night calendar. And then there's this spiral shape. And that's the Milky Way calendar. And the way that the Milky Way calendar works, if I tap that icon again, it's going to expand and show me what things are meaning you know right here I got these dots these green dots that are showing up and you can see that they're showing up on the calendar over here the first part of the month nothing nothing great about it but then there's some singular dots which means less than two hours these singular dots right here on these nights there's less than two hours of Milky Way core without a moon the other nights there's never a time where the core is risen and there's no moon. There's just always a moon, and the core is getting blocked by it. So then our first real night is the 21st. I'd recommend that you go out on the 31st and 30th. Those are the two nights that you should go out, if you go out in January at all. But if you're looking at the 21st through 31st, you can see this calendar already. Boom, there's more than that. If I go into the next month of February, you can see that I'm starting to get double dots. Look at that. There's one day of them. If I go into March, I'm getting two weeks of double dots. And I think it's time now for me to make this the focus. So if you're thinking about, I'm going to be in Utah in May, which night should I go out? Well, you're going to answer that right here with this calendar. So I'm going to make this nice and big so you can see. In fact, I'm going to go up a little bit so you can see which month I'm on. All right, cool. I'm going to leave it right there. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so we're in March. Look how many dates come in. I continue on April 
May. Even in May, you don't have four dots yet. You just have three, which means that you have more than four hours. I guess that's right. They never have four dots. More than four hours. Then there's two for more than two. And then there's one for less than two. So you just know that there's less than two, more than two, or more than four. And there's one whole week around the new moon that's terrific where you get more than four hours in May. Going into June, practically the whole month has that, but there are just times with the moon being after a full moon or just before a full moon that you're really going to get less than two hours. But less than two hours can be enough depending on your subject and how willing you are to drive. So you're going to want to know these things before you go out for Milky Way. I'm going to go ahead and just get back over to the main screen. And we're going to go back into our tips. So I wanted to show you that in Planet. Remember, it's up there in the hamburger menu, and you go down to Calendar, which you can't see very clearly right now. But go to Calendar and click on that, and that's where you get it. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, let's continue. So now, find a dark sky location. So where will you find a dark sky, and how can you find that? Oh. For Chris Whiting, I want to mention this comment. For a quick and free, easy to read app, Planet Live works well. And that is free. And, and Chris, can you verify whether or not the calendar exists in the free version? Because I don't know for sure. I'm imagining that it does. So if you can check that. Milky Way Core here in Australia, second, 22nd of January, weather pending. Yeah. I mean, you do have a better weather season that you're getting out of, but you're going into the fall. And I guess you're not really. You're still summer. But uh, just as long as the weather is good, you've got it. So then... Anyone know where to get the new common info in a stellarium? Ha <laughs> ha yes. All right, this is totally off schedule, but we're gonna do this because I learned this on NeoWise. Go to Stellarium app, open it up. Now I need to find out what the name of this comet is. So upcoming comet, I'm just gonna do that. And it's gonna tell me that this upcoming comet is gonna be C22, C2022 E3 ZTF. It's already visible as a faint patch. This is January 11th, 2023. So I got a little bit of an update already. So this 2022 E3 Z2 ZTF, I'm gonna use that information in Stellarium. Let me go ahead and go back into Stellarium. And I am going to, um, you know what? I think it's okay if I keep the chat on, honestly. I'm just gonna go for it, even though we're cu cutting off some of the sky. We'll, we'll work around it. What happens here, in Stellarium is you have a search window and you can type in things like Comet. And it's like, well, which Comet? Well, we know that it was called Comet C2022 E3 ZTF. Let's just try that. And it's querying, but it's not finding it, right? So what ends up happening is that you need to go into your options and you have to download information. And, ooh, do 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 lists. Here's the list that we need to look for. We're going to change this to... Ooh, I'm starting to forget what I actually taught. Hmm. It's a very quick, short tip, a two-minute tip. But here's all these other comments, but I can update this list. So, you know, it might even be worthwhile just to share it because i got to refresh my own memory, and I don't think it'll be a terrible experience if you do it from my YouTube channel. So... Other than the double speak that was happening when you can hear me on live, if I play a video, you will hear it, which is good news. So you go into my videos, and you go to videos, and you can go through and see my two-minute tips, how to add comment NeoWise. I'm going to refresh myself. So here we go. Oh, huh. There's no, there's no comment. All right, let me go in here and search for it. Okay, 2020 comp. Oh, and you see nothing. Really you can't Sorry. find it and we need to install it. Go to the left, you'll find your configuration window, open that up, there's all these tabs, we want plugins, and go down to Solar System Editor. From there, you can click configure or double click the word, I'm gonna double click, and. Okay, we're gonna pause it there for a second, because I also want to bring in this desktop a little bit better, so you can see everything, and then, just pay attention to what happens here. here solar system options, editor, the configuration, the configuration file, file solar, solar system, system yada yada. And then and you solar go system down, down here. We're going to import import orbital elements in MPC. Okay, so we're going to go into here and do it correctly. So do 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 do. <laughs> configuration window, solar system extras. Um, K K K. Configuration plugins solar system. Okay, plugins. And then I went down to solar system editor and go to configure. 
and I go to solar system and I'm going to go into import orbital elements, comets, and let's go ahead and select a bookmark. Last time we used the Gideon von Bautinen and get orbital elements and let's see if that will include ours. And it is called what again? Let me minimize this video. This is a good deterrent and like distraction, I believe, but sorry for a bit of a tangent because I just I'm really excited about this too. 2022 E3 ZTF. 2022 E3 ZTF. And it's C, C, not P. So C 2022. So let me just start typing C 2022 E3 E3 ZTF. Haha, <laughs> there we go, add objects. So now I found 2022 E3 ZTF by typing them all in. I can close those settings and go back into Stellarium and see where it is. So if I already have it up, it'll be there. I don't believe it's showing up. Let's go ahead and do the search. Oh, not that, sorry. I'm gonna do the search in the location window and type in C forward slash 2022. Oh, I killed the C. 2022 E3 uh, comments. I just added it, but you're not loading it. Come on. Do, 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 do. Just a refresher for everyone's sake and to see what I messed up. Plugins, Solar System Editor, Configure. I went to Solar System. I went down to Import Orbital Elements, and then I chose from a bookmark right here, and I chose. Oh, there's all sorts now. Where's von Bautinen? Um, comets, that's why. Von Bautinen is only with comets. So Gideon von Bautinen, and then get orbital elements. It does show, I need to check that, and then hit add object. Didn't it add? Let's go ahead and check it again. Oh, I haven't chosen a bookmark, whoops. Ooh, it moved off to asteroids again, that's why. Find Bouton in comments, get orbital elements, Z3, add new and update existing, add objects. Okay, I've clicked it twice. Come on, friends. Make sure this works, Stellarium. So now I'm going to go into my search window, not that window. I have too many windows open now. And if I go for that, 2022. Oh, come on, Mar. Varum, neat. I'm going to go for close it and open it up again. Come on, Stellarium. Update. Oh, I'm hoping. So no calendar only gives the next week. I did that to Neowise, but I can't remember now. Awesome. Maybe Stellarium has to restart. <laughs> yeah, he's reading my mind. Good job. So now we're going to find out. It may be something I just can't search for right now for some reason. But it, Oh, there it is. Sweet. Just need to reboot. Just need to reboot. And I'm going to get rid of the horizon ground, and I can see it right there. Boom. All right, so now I can see that comet is below the horizon. And now I'm going to go ahead and bring the horizon back, and I'm going to go forward in time. If you want, you can go into your date time window and just change things by the hour. And while you have it selected, which seems to not be selected anymore. No, no, it is. It's just below. Let's go forward in the night. Okay, there it goes, up into the night sky. So if I wanted to see it, you want to kind of star hop from Arcturus. And here on my latitude line, it's not going to be visible until 1230 above the horizon. And I'm going to see it as a little green capture. If you do a photo, you capture a photo of this, you're going to see a little green blob, kind of like Comet Wirtanen. Let's go ahead and go to Alan Dyer's. Alan Dyer, Comet Wirtanen from years ago. And Alan Dyer had a good image of it, showing off the green little fuzz. You know, this is what you can't expect. So AmazingSky.com, Alan Dyer, good book. You should get that. And this is the comet that he captured of Comet Wirtanen. This may be all that we see with this comet, and that might be the best that we got. But obviously, everyone remembers the COVID blessing of the year was that we had Neowise. And Neowise ended up, I'm going to look up Mary Beth Kaczynski's image because it's so good. Kaczynski. And you're going to see a fantastic capture over a bridge eventually. Oh, man, she got so many images. There it is. There's the one that I wanted. 
Um, your connection's not private. That's okay. Go for it. What do you mean? Has my SSL died? No. I got to pay for the secure. Um, just go anyway. Just go for it. <laughs> I know it's safe. It's my own website. Ah, uh, man. I got to pay for that again. I thought I just paid for it. Man, what happened? Oh, well, we'll figure that out. You can see the picture right here. I'm going to make it a little more clear for everybody. Oh, that's funny. It went smaller. But if I move it over still, get it out of my picture, that is Comet Neowise with a big old tail. It even had a split on the tail. So we can get some hope that we'll get that out of Comet, um, I guess, E3, ZTF. I'm not sure if they have a nickname for it or anything yet. But this Comet is what's in the sky, and you can see the transfer of the northern ele northern elevation. And there it goes. And then it comes back into the daytime. So what happened? It just rotated. Let me zoom out and see where it went. Up, 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 high in the sky. Oh, it goes to absolutely straight above us and continues around. And this is going to change over the months. In fact, let me just show that off before I'm done and do a refresh. So right here at, let's do midnight, 1230. This is where it is right now. Going into Jan February, and now it goes lower. So let's go back into maybe the peak of middle of February. Look how high it gets right around Mars. So if you need to find it around February 13th or like Valentine's Day, you're not doing anything special, you got it next to Aldebaran. And maybe by then it'll have some sweet visible trails. Now, I don't know the calendar yet of it, when it actually goes past the sun and then we start seeing, because around its orbit of the sun is when we start seeing the tail. And so we'd have to look that up, but I won't look it up right now. Just want to remind everybody, you go into Solarium, go to Configuration Window. Go to Plugins. Scroll down on your list until you see Solar System Editor. Solar System Editor will allow you to have a Configure button that you pick Configure. Then you go down to or up to the tabs and hit click Solar System. Then you go down to Import Orbital Elements in MPC Format. And then you change it to Comets. Choose the Von Boutenen one, Gideon Von Boutenen, and then you go ahead and get Orbital Elements. And that's where you can specifically choose the one you want to add. Check that box. Add objects. Kablamo. Now it's in there. Cool. That was a good tangent. Love it. But we got to get back onto our thing. How much time did I take? Oh, it's only 734. Not the worst. I've done worse before. So not so bad. So, all right. Cool. Here we go. Ba -ba -boom. Back into the tip sheet. So here on the tip sheet, which I was moved over to this position and bring back the chat. Bring back the chat. Bring out your dead is what I'm thinking right now. Um, got my gray background turned back on and the small chat window here. Kablamo. Another kablamo. Two kablamos in one minute. All right. So find a dark sky location. We're going to go through this one actually pretty quickly. And that is over here. And I will minimize this to be a better window in the window space that we have now allotted. And I'm going to show you light pollution info, light pollution map info, which is the best one now. It used to be other sites like dark site finder, but now light pollution map info is terrific. I've even paid to remove the ads and it doesn't seem to work. Light pollution map info. Oh, that's like three L's. Okay. I'm like, I don't see a misspelling in the normal locations. There we go. I put in a million L's. So then you look at your location where you're at and you'll find out what the light pollution's like. And this is very accurate. It has a very good up-to-date map. There's other maps you can choose from. You can choose from all sorts of map layers. Oh, they've minimized that. So now it's just a drop down. So there's all the big ones that you can get into. Just the default one is great. As long as you see this, you're going to get a big enough an idea. I was just talking on Instagram about a place that's only 30 minutes from me. So here I am in Provo where it's light polluted. But if I drive out here on the 6, I can go out past Eureka and then go up a road right here. And I'm in a Bortle. I'm going to click so the cursor shows up there. Uh, oh, hold it down. And it says it's a class 2, and I'm looking out over a 0. It goes from 2 to 0, looking out towards a southern, southwestern Milky Way late in the season. But in the beginning of the season, I'm looking in this area, and I'm seeing um, the Milky Way over some of this light pollution, but not too much. All of this is such a small bloom, it doesn't affect. So the second thing you need to know is, how do I find a dark sky location?
And what I want to emphasize to you before I move on to the next tip is that you can be standing in any of this light pollution if you're outside of the red looking towards dark skies. So you don't have to find yourself a spot that's exactly finally beyond this green. You, I got a Milky Way shot. In fact, my first ever was in Strawberry Reservoir. Actually, I did pass by. I went through the green into the blue, and we captured it off of this spot. My first ever Milky Way was out there. And as long as I didn't have an island of light that was too close, it was good. Look at the salt flats. I'm standing right here, and that bloom of Salt Lake, even though it's that far away, that bloom became what this is, the yellow on this image. That's the Salt Lake City light pollution. And so that is a challenge. What is the blob of light west of Moab, a mining operation? Yeah, most likely. Um, when you look at Moab down here, oh, this is the um, potash area where they have those potash. Um, t -t 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 -t. They are reservoirs that are... Um, what's the word? Ex evaporating ponds. There are evaporating ponds next to Moab. So maps.google.com and you go to Moab. Uh, Maob. How about Moab? And you go to this area, you'll see it. Let me make this smaller. So just west of us, go on to the satellite view and you'll see all this purple. So I'm thinking that's the potash area. All of this river, look at the light pollution by the river. Here's the actual reflecting ponds. Interesting. So that is just a bloom off there. And in this case, I believe that is a glitch. That's got to be a glitch. It's almost identical to Moab, and there's nothing that bright. Now that I look twice, I'm like, nah, because the potash fields are down here. There's those ponds, potash ponds. So that's got to be a glitch, and that will happen unfortunately. But the good news is, is once you're there, you're going to find out that, oh, it's even better than you thought. That's an interesting glitch, though. <laughs> Thanks for noticing that, uh, Tim. Was it Tim? It was Todd. No, it wasn't Todd. It was Henry. It was Henry. Yeah, you knew better than I that that should have been a glitch, because what would that be? Anyhow, so this is lightpollutionmap.info. Info. It has great maps and you can see how to work around them. Just know that if you're on the East Coast and you're looking at these small islands of dark, you don't have to feel obligated to go in the dead center of them. Just make sure you go to the part that leads you the most dark sky between you and the Milky Way. If you want like the be, the be all end all most ideal option, it's going to be Southeast Milky Way going on this side looking over here like if you were right here in Johnsburg looking out You'd still be in a dark sky You might have some blooms that are higher in your frame if you want to get those blooms lower in your frame go further from it and somewhere out there in the uh, What was this Adirondack? Yeah, so then this area from this spot would be great looking in the early season This spot looking south in the summer and then these spots looking west southwest in the fall that's what you would think about, and that's what you should know. All right, so now that you've figured out that the moon and the Milky Way are cooperating, and I have a dark sky location, I know where to go, that night, will there be clouds? Will there be clouds? And my favorite apps for that are cleardarksky.com for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere as well as North America. These clear sky charts, let me minimize this a little bit more. The clear sky charts are only for Mexico, Canada, and the US. So this is not your option if you're outside of these areas. But if you're in Utah, you can see the map and some ads. Hello, ad. And there is going to be a map of all the satellite or the weather stations around that are being used for this, and you can get up to date for the next three days. And you get this kind of a, this kind of a graphic that teaches you that, okay, there's cloud cover, good or bad. Good is blue. Dark blue is no clouds in the sky. White is when it's bad. And then you got transparency and seeing. So as you're looking at this, you're looking, okay, I want as many blue squares as possible. This would be more of a window, but it's middle of the day. If I'm looking at night, I've got this two cloud cover, which is a new data point, the ECMWF cloud. I want to check it out. A sponsored feature. Interesting. This is not a CMC forecast. It's the data from the European forecast model. It provides a clear uh, cloud cover forecast. It's here for comparison with the CMC. New data becomes available around 2 to 
two, <laughs> two in the afternoon to two in the morning, which is different than when the CMC forecast updates. Okay, interesting. So just in, they're just bringing in some European numbers, which those European numbers, for instance, Fish Lake, let's try another location that's an actual city. So going on here, I'm going to do, um, come on, an actual city or some Pratt is in a city, but Green River. Let's do Green River. So this is the Green River map, and then, oh. Okay, they didn't have any of that information for that. They didn't have the extra cloud cover. I wanted to compare it against clear outside, because clear outside is the next option that you should use, clearoutside.com, and that one gives you a prediction for five days out. I wouldn't trust anything beyond two days for being perfect, but it's a very good way of knowing if you should go or not, and it gives you total clouds covered, but I love how it gives you low, medium, and high clouds. You can kind of plan a sunset and sunrise looking at this as well. And so you can see blue is better, white is bad, and you can see Tuesday's up right now, but you can go all the way... Oh, excuse me. All the way to Wednesday. I need some more oxygen. And so Wednesday is a little out of the realm of possible that, oh, yeah, I know that at 7 a.m. it's going to be exactly 81% totally obscured. No, don't do that. Just pay attention to what's happening in the next couple days. So if I was thinking about going around tomorrow, which is a waning crescent, almost a new moon. The new moon's on the 21st, and I'm looking at my opportunity. I want to center it on midnight, which is now centered. And in this area of Exeter, Devon, UK, Devon, UK, this is saying that Friday would be good during the day <laughs> and then bad when I want it because the Milky Way comes up at 5 to 7 a.m. So this is terrible. It's great for my viewing of the International Space Station, but it's not going to be great there. So if you want to find a place in here, you just got to look at a city. So like Green River, USA. And we can find out what its forecast is. And now looking at the current numbers, it's clear on Wednesday until 2 p.m. Green River was clear on Wednesday until 5 p.m. So the differences are minor and just a couple hours, but they confer. And that's something that you should pay attention to. If you use both witnesses and have them balance against each other, you can confer your information and match it up better. And that's what I use both of these for. And that's how you know whether the clouds will be in your way. All right, so now we're gonna go into some stuff that's more quick hit. No gear, camera, and lens. I hit this up on the Instagram and I talked about it. Basically what's happening here is that you're gonna look at your camera and find out if you can actually get your focus and if you can go higher ISO. And getting focus is critical, and higher ISO is absolutely beneficial for having a good image, but you can get away with it. If you can get your focus, though, you'll be happy with your image, maybe with some work on post-processing to fix your ISO or fix your exposure settings, but you want that focus first. And so what happens is in the back of your camera, <sighs> excuse me, yeah, I just barely got a few good nights of sleep, barely, and I'm trying to catch up, but I'm not there yet. So in the back of your camera, your LCD screen, you're going to want to be able to go into that on live view and see it as big as possible. You want to see those stars that you can see in the sky. Depending on your camera body and your camera lens, it'll be easy to see stars or it'll be practically impossible to see stars in live view. And that's critical to find out, which is why I mentioned it basically again here in the Know Your Gear, Do You Have a Live View? So this first one, I jumped the gun about live view and focus stuff. The camera and lens topic here was basically, can you make a higher ISO than 1600? Can you set your settings up beyond maybe the 6400? Because I like to start at 6400 ISO and go from there when I'm doing stationary single image shots. And then your lens, you want to know how big is the aperture. I can't compare right now, but I can show off. Yeah. Ooh. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I had to find my lens in my bag. I went through all the pockets that were wrong first, of course. So look at this. Let me go full screen on this guy. So if you look at the giant aperture space that we have in here, you can notice that it's pretty fantastic and nice and big. And when I change my f-stop down to like f-22, it becomes very narrow, and then it gets bigger and bigger as I open up. I stop this down to f2 and it's still a massive open aperture or as we like to call it the telescope world the light bucket that has as much light as possible that's going to suck in which why it makes this rokinon f1.4 one of my favorite lenses of all time love it that thing is cheap and it works fantastic and so know that your gear is going to work 
your camera has ability to go and change your ISO. You have the ability for it to um, get the right exposure as well as your lens has a wide open enough aperture. Then the second thing was what I started talking about with the live view, where you want to make sure your camera, your gear actually has a live view so you can clearly and easily see your stars and then get focus on them. And I have given away my Lumi Loop and I keep forgetting to order on Amazon. I need to get that back, baby. So my Lumi Loop is kind of like this. This is a subject that you put on the back of your camera and you look through it. It's a loop, a magnifying loop. And I have my camera on the live view zoomed in to my star. And I see it as a bright orb in the center of my lens. And then I look through my loop and I see it even magnified another 10 times. And now I have the biggest as possible shape to watch as I change my focus manually and I get that focus perfectly. So I want that live view to exist. So the other thing you want to be able to do, and this is, these are kind of nitpicky, the next... The, this one right here, white balance, be able to change it. It's nice. Um, every camera really has that, but you want to pick your favorite. And so I just gave the tip of know that you should be between 3,800 and 5,000. I mean, that's a really good range. 5,500 is even great. We're talking about the most accurate Roger Clark Milky Way stars, the warmer, the better. And then if you want to talk about something that we just like it kind of blue, we like it kind of cooler colors. You're going to hang out around 3,800 K Royce bear was 3,800 K when he began. And now he's 4,500. That's where he starts all his shots. And I just recommend that you choose one and stick with it. That way, when you go to an area that has some air glow, you're going to notice the difference in the air glow once you're looking through that camera at your first shot. And you go, oh, look at that. Because the white balance is consistent, you'll notice a difference in green. All right. Oh, you know what? I never showed the screen of this tip, but I don't think it really made a difference for anyone. So now we're on number seven, know your gear shutter. And that is that you have the ability to get your right shutter setting and you set it to what you want. And that's going to require you to come over to your phone again. So let me go over to mine and bring up the screen that focuses on just that. And I'm going to turn off my zoom currently and we're going to pop out and we're going to go into the photo pills app. The photo pills app has the ability to go in and know your shutter because the shutter question is answering two things. It's saying, okay, what lens do you have? And at what millimeter are you going to use it at? What focal length? And based on that, plus your camera body, your shutter is going to be decided for you. You're going to want trailing or are you okay with no trailing? Okay, I want no trailing. It's going to give me a certain number of seconds. If I want some trailing, it'll give me a little bit more seconds. And we're going to show you that right here in Spot Stars. Spot Stars, go into that. Make sure you'll see up here it has Canon 5D Mark IV. Let's go and bring our zoom to display back. And I'm going to go massive, but I'm going to zoom up. Oh, you know what? This is good enough for me right here. All of that. That way you can see all the information that's pertinent. So right here, Canon EOS 5D, that's the camera body that I have. And the camera lens is not at 16 millimeter, but it's going to be at 24, a Rokinon. And I'm not going to be at f2.8. I'm going to be at f2, stopped up to f2. And now looking at that, I stopped down technically, down to f2. And I can choose between accurate, or default. If you look at these folk, these options again, it's basically, do I want some trails? I'm okay with it. Or do I want really accurate dots so that it's great for printing? And so I'm going to go accurate. And then I don't go off the 500 rule. I go off the MPF rule because it takes into account those megapixels on my camera, my camera sensor, and other math that's involved. And that'll give me a number. So with the 500 rule, classically, I would have 21 seconds. I'm not going to want that. I'm going to want 4.57. Now, my rule of thumb is go for what the MPF rule is plus four. You know, just make it easy. I do MPF rule four plus 4.57 on my camera, add four seconds, and I just do eight seconds. I round it down to eight. So it's eight seconds for my shutter on that camera, that camera body with that lens, this lens right here. And if I use that lens, I have 13 seconds. And it's all based off of the MPF rule right here in the Spot Stars app of Photo Pills. So the Spot Stars pill within Photo Pills app, you're going to have this information as long as you put everything accurate to what gear you have. All right. So then back to the full screen right here. Uh, minimize that. Yep. 
So back to there, you got that shutter you're deciding on. And once you decide on that shutter, you've picked your lens. It's, it's being dictated to you what the shutter should be. You're going to want to have your aperture open as full as possible. So then how do you adjust your histogram to make sure it's good? Well, that's the tip number eight. Know your gear. I mentioned uh, the histogram was mentioned in the last video, so it wasn't with this one. So this histogram that you're seeing the graphic of right here is the ideal single image capture of the Milky Way core with no light painting. With no light painting, you're going to want this histogram where basically the front of the mid-tone start touching the middle point and you have a separation gap between the blacks of the foreground and your starry mid-tones. I have some questions that I want to address real quick. So Ron S. asked before, does seeing affect wide field photography or is it just higher focal length? Honestly, what happens with seeing and transparency is that they're more for like the deep sky objects and planets. And I, if I'm correct, transparency is dealing with planets and seeing is dealing with deep sky. But I may have those reversed. I always do have them reversed in my head. And so let's just reference it again over here on clear dark sky. Transparency forecast the transparency of the air. Here, transparency means what astronomers mean by the word, the total transparency of the atmosphere from ground to space. So the transparency between ground all the way up to space. And it's dealing with um, a transparency like um, moisture, turbulence, that kind of issue. And <clears throat> water vapor particularly, that's right, water vapor in the air particularly right there. So that is what we're concerned about in transparency. And if there's bad water vapor in the air, you'll have bad transparency. And above average transparency is necessary for good observation of the low contrast objects like nebulas. I need to get them backwards again. Planets is seeing, transparency is low contrast objects. So when you've got galaxies and nebulas that you want to have visible, you want great transparency in your sky. If you're going for just the Milky Way, all you care about is cloud cover. That's all you care about. But if you want to capture deep sky, or if you even want to do an astromodified lens and you, well, even though, if you do a wide field view, you honestly are going to capture what you capture. With transparency and seeing, there'll be some minor differences. But if you're zooming in with a zoom, telephoto, and your deep sky photography, you will want transparency in all of your nebula and all of your uh, galaxies. So you want to capture Whirlpool Galaxy? Check your transparency and clouds. You want to capture the Dumbbell Nebula or Orion Nebula or the Horsehead Nebula? You're going to want to check your transparency. But if you want to capture Jupiter or even maybe the moon and you want some clarity and cleanness, you're going to want seeing to be fantastic. And reference to seeing is this is um, Excellent seeing means that high magnification, you will see fine detail on planets. In bad seeing, they might look like they're under a layer of rippling water and show little detail at any magnification. So you want to see Jupiter stripes, you know, on the clouds, you're going to want to have better seeing. So I think what we did is answer the question that Ron asked, but he said the answer himself. That seeing affects the wide field photography or is it just higher focal length? Oh, he gave both. Yeah, seeing affects the higher focal length. Those are the times that you're worried about it. And uh, transparency helps you with seeing the still at higher focal length, but also dealing with low contrast objects. Cool, cool, cool. So I'm going to go into my tip sheet again where I'm just showing the histogram and then checking out another one. Does f-stop affect time? Yes and no. So if he's talking about changing it extremely from like f2.8 as wide as you can go and going to f22, he's going to have to do a longer shutter just to make sure he can see it. So here he is. He's got his camera set up where it's like, okay, I put this lens on. Widest open is f2.8. All right, that's my f-stop. And then he goes and says, you know what? I'm going to bring that f-stop up to f4.5. So he's changed his f-stop to f4.5. I don't even know if f4.5 is a number right now. I'm, my brain is f4, 5.6, and 3. Point. Yeah, that's right. So we're looking at f4, and he's thinking and considering of doing it, but... He's like, all right, with that, I have to adjust my other settings. My camera body is going to go for a shutter that is going to keep it clean. So then I'm not going to want to change the star trailing. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust in the ISO to make my histogram look good. So say in your situation, Tim, that you've changed your f-stop down to something else. You wanted to go to 3.5. And you decide 3.5 would be great. And you're sticking with your no trailing at 8 seconds. 
now you've caused your histogram to be more bunched up to the left. And when you see this histogram bunched up to the left, there's no good separation between the foreground black and the midtones. You're going to want to bring that, spread that out a little bit more by bringing up your ISO. And this tip sheet is reminding you that, um, control zoom, that the histogram will dictate your ISO setting. So know your gear, know your histogram, see where you actually can find your histogram. It's not your live view histogram. It's where on the camera you take a picture and you see that histogram afterwards. That is what you check after you take a picture of the core with no light painting. And if you get this shape, you are golden. And if you're not, push your ISO up higher and higher till you get it. All right, we're almost done with all 10 and it's currently four minutes until closing time. Um, and oh, Tim actually had a question, had a correction on there. He's like, I mean for star trailing with F stop affecting time. Okay, um, let me just show you what you're asking. I believe will be accurate with what you're asking. And let's do this. So watch what happens where it's MPF rule 4.57 and I change my f-stop to be fully open at f1.4. At f1.4, it's now 4.16. So the more open my aperture, the shorter my shutter will be. If I am gonna go for f, eight for some reason look at how long it can go i'm not going to get star trailing until i get up beyond 8.78 seconds so with your question tim basically the more open your aperture you're gonna have fewer seconds before trailing becomes visible when you shut your aperture tighter the trailing is not as visible because as you see and focus on your star when you change your aperture your star bloat becomes this size to this size to this size it gets smaller the bloat around the color of the star becomes smaller as you stop your aperture down and that's why it's giving you much more time before it's noticeable trailing so awesome cool i'm glad that i understood your question better thanks for hitting me up again and again that way i knew not to mess it up all right let's go back in and finish these out so then nine know your gear iso i mentioned basically all the stuff you need to know about iso but just know where it is knowing your gear where iso is and why do i say that because when you have your camera well known to you and you can use it in the dark People around you will be much happier. You won't be very much happier. It doesn't really change much for you. I mean, if you're, why am I wearing these headphones? I wanted to hear that video and I've been wearing them ever since. I was gonna wear my wig. Let's end with my wig on. Where's the cool one? Is this the cool one? Yeah. Whew. Yeah, there we go. No headphones and massive wig. We're going to end it like this. Okay, so with the ISO, you're going to say, all right, I'm going to fix my ISO. I'm going to change it without turning my headlamp on, and everyone around you is going to love you for doing that. If you can do it naturally without trying to find it or turn on any lights, people will be gr very grateful when they're out shooting with you. So know your gear. Where's the ISO button again? Now, ISO not specifically the most important one. Just know where all your buttons are. Know how to change every setting from aperture to shutter length to your ISO. I mean, I'm hitting my map, my camera with a button for the ISO. It's a wheel for my shutter. And on the back, I change my aperture. If the, if it's, if it's automatic, I can switch this wheel on the back, or I have to reach to the lens and twist it that way. So that is what you want to know. Know your gear so you can use it in the dark. And then the last thing is that find these settings. Cause you don't want to try and do this on the spot. You're going to freak out, oh, freak out, I'm gonna freak out. <laughs> I wish I had hair. Ah, uh, so awesome. I know that a lot of you are more attracted to me now that I have a full head of hair, but this is not real, so calm down. Calm down. This is just Aaron with a wig. <laughs> ah, it affects star bloat. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, man. So here we go looking at the last one. These are some of these extra tips, extra miscellaneous settings that you'll need to change in your camera. Find out where the heck they are. That's Sharon. Uh, Sharon, you get a little more color when you stop down. That's interesting. Um, I'm interested in seeing how accurate that is. I think what happens is she's mentioning the aberration that bloats the color and kind of overtakes the actual color. When you stop down, you get the true color and not any of the color aberration. I bet that's what ha what's happening. I don't know for a fact, but I believe her, and that sounds awesome. So then looking at this know your gear raw and and noise reduction these are just settings you should turn off make sure you're in raw and if you want a jpeg as well do jpeg and raw and make sure you're capturing where you want to change your kelvin on your white balance don't just do like tungsten change it to the actual number you want know where to find that setting and also in like canon camera specifically we have high iso noise reduction and long exposure noise reduction i know that there's versions of this in sony and nikon as well just turn
termed a little bit different. Basically, it's just noise reduction handling on long exposure and noise reduction handling in the camera on high ISO. You don't need those handling themselves on the camera. First off, long exposure noise reduction is the worst. You capture an eight second shot. After that shot, it'll take an eight second dark frame. And you have to wait every time. If you want your panel to go as slow as possible, keep that long noise reduction exposure on, the long exposure noise reduction setting on. Leave it on if you like that. It's torture. You don't want that. What you want is to keep it off and fix anything in post that you need to. Don't let your camera body decide for you how to handle some noise. Just take that raw as crisp as it is and work with it in post. All right, that is everything. Woohoo! We are going to zoom out eventually. <laughs> I think it's going to zoom out. Do I need to do this? Ah, there we go. I can do that. So this P PDF, I shared it with you at the beginning. If you came in late and you're like, hey, I want to have that PDF, let me share with you a link right now. It goes directly to my Dropbox, and you can download this PDF, save it on your phone, and work with it. <laughs> Kathy says, wow, I want you to pose in a Milky Way photo with that wig on. What do you mean? It's just in the dark. We won't see anything. It's not like there's going to be anything great. <sighs> let me get some, like, natural looking curls going in front of my ear. I don't know, I look like a girl. I don't look like a guy anymore. This other one I look like a guy more, but it's not that great. It, like it doesn't really, I was trying to get a cool wig for Halloween, that's the back, or is that the front? <laughs> I look like a British person. No offense British people with this kind of a hairstyle. I feel like I should sing Wonder Wall. Let me move this over to the I'm too cool side. Hey, what's up? <laughs> oh, it doesn't look natural at all. Can anyone say toupee? I don't even have brown hair. I'm a blonde hair guy. At least I was before I was half skin and half hair. But uh, yeah, that sounds right, Aaron. Less aberration would make for truer colors. Yeah, Sharon West says yes. Okay, Kathy, I will bring them. I'll accommodate. But I'm also going to bring the pink one for the long hair pink one and the blue one. Those are cool. All right. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for hanging out with me again and being out here on Milky Way Wednesday. I'm Aaron King with Photog Adventures. I'm doing this every Wednesday. It's 8.03. If you haven't seen the link yet,